entitling my remarks from audit to innovation uh, because I think we've all, um, we all understand um, that we are in a, in a sphere uh, beyond um, and simply audit-based uh, regimes um, in, in this space. Um, over the past of, uh, of the two decades, uh, um, companies have come to realize uh, that they do have um, a, uh, a set of roles and responsibilities uh, in addressing um, labor conditions and labor standards uh, and other social impacts within their supply chains. In your, your, your own um, uh, institution, your own initiative, um, is testimony to that fact. Uh, as, has mentioned, as was mentioned already, you've um, celebrated a 10th anniversary. Congratulations. Many happy returns. Um, and you have a new code of conduct, um, uh, which uh, uh, is, is partially um, um, uh, reflecting um, the, uh, the, the need for, for change, and I'm delighted to say also reflects um, elements of the UN guiding principles. Uh, that's what they're for. They're intended not as a toolkit that you take off the shelf and plug in, but rather as a basis for thinking um, how these principles apply to your specific situation, um, whatever it may be. Now, to return to a point that Jan already mentioned um, earlier, um, it's a foundational understanding of the guiding principles that companies by themselves cannot be expected to and are unable to solve all the world's problems. Um, and uh, that is true also of global labor injustice. Um, the fact that many of the goods that we wear or watch uh, or communicate with uh, or even the food we eat and the beverages we drink um, in many uh, situations and many uh, 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 occasions may be produced in conditions that are abusive to workers. Um, because companies by themselves are not expected to solve all of these problems, the guiding principles make a specific point uh, to reaffirm and elaborate upon the obligations of states as the primary rock uh, bottom, as it were, uh, of the international human rights regime. Uh, the legal obligations that states have undertaken um, as um, uh, parties to various international human rights treaties, um, and the important enabling role, um, regulatory role, uh, and judicial roles that flow from those obligations. And so, um, it established right up front um, that the state is the critical player or a critical player uh, and the state duty to protect human rights is the fundament of the international human rights regime. But the guiding principles also affirm an independent corporate responsibility to respect rights. And by independent, I mean irrespective of whether or not a government is doing a good job. Being in an environment where government does a lousy job doesn't mean that the responsibility to respect human rights doesn't hold for companies. It does. Now, respecting rights, respecting human rights, uh, means that businesses should avoid infringing on the rights of others as they go about their activities um, and their business relationships. Uh, and this, in turn, requires um, an effective human rights due diligence process, which is one of the core elements um, of the UN guiding principles, um, and remedial measures when things go wrong, as they always do. Um, I recently saw um, a, an, a, a sustainability report by a mining company, um, and it said something that I wish more companies would say. Um, it said, we, ha we have aligned our policies and our practices with the UN guiding principles. We will continue to make mistakes. When we do, judge us not by the mistakes that we make, but by how we respond to them. As I say, I wish more companies would be that honest, rather than trying to pretend that there are no problems, which too many companies do. So it's the uh, corporate responsibility to respect human rights that's the focus of of my remarks um, this, this morning. What the guiding principles have added to the equation uh, is to stipulate um, and inform um, more robust and effective ways 
uh, to, to uh, achieve better and more sustainable results um, than uh, existed before. So with due recognition to the many other efforts that have been undertaken, uh, what I'd like to do is take a step back um, and, and, and share with you my own assessment of, of where we're at today um, and where we need to go, what further we need to do. Now, for businesses such as yours, any such assessment uh, begins with uh, social compliance auditing. Hundreds of thousands of such audits are conducted each year to ensure minimum workplace um, conditions in companies, uh, in supply chains. Yet exhaustive research, definitive research, has shown that auditing alone has failed to generate sustained improvements um, in many social performance issues, um, including working hours, overtime, wage levels, and freedom of association. This is true even for, for leading global companies that have invested enormous resources uh, in time, money, and people um, in achieving it. Um, a new book is out, I don't know if you've seen it, by Richard Locke. Um, it um, was based on um, internal auditing data that a number of leading companies turned over to him, uh, and as well as comparative studies of different sectors and industries. Um, I have the title here somewhere. It is called The, Li the Promise and Limits of Private Power. Uh, it, 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 there is no more exhaustive study of why auditing has failed to produce sustainable change. So that's the starting point. Now, there are so many reasons why um, this is so. Um, and they're so well known by now that there isn't really much need for me to rehearse them here yet again. Um, instead, what I'd like to do um, is to look at a growing body of, of practice um, by individuals, uh, companies, and by um, groups of companies with supplementary and alternative approaches to addressing social performance issues uh, in supply chains. Um, some of which were inspired by the UN guiding principles. Uh, and I draw here on an, an important uh, piece of work done by SHIFT, uh, the New York-based nonprofit that I also chair, uh, founded by members of my former UN team, uh, dedicated to making the guiding principles work in practice uh, in different industry sectors and different country contexts. Uh, and the newer approaches that they have collated um, uh, in their work essentially seek to recast the very nature of the relationship between global buyers um, and their suppliers, from policing to partnership. Now, I, I don't want to be accused of having a Moses complex, so I didn't come up with 10 themes. I only came up with nine. Uh, and some of these will be familiar to you, um, others perhaps uh, not so much. But the first theme of this sort of newer generation of practices uh, is a shift from uh, pass-fail compliance to a comprehensive continuous improvement program. So from compliance to continuous improvement. Under a continuous improvement model, uh, companies shift the focus from the findings of an audit to what happens after the audit. Suppliers are held accountable for their progress on work plans that are developed after the audit comes in. Uh, what, pr what, what, prior what, what priority remedial actions, for example, uh, need to be based on the audit um, findings. And by, by placing less emphasis on audit findings and more on progress to achieve results, uh, continuous improvement models um, also tend to elicit greater honesty on the part of the suppliers. As you know, one of the core problems with audits is that people lie. Uh, and they lie because they fear commercial consequences. So in a sense, this model involves a shift from a blame culture to a learning culture. Right? Um, and it requires new metrics. It requires 
performance metrics, not audit metrics. And the qualitative difference between the two uh, is significant. So a shift from, fast, from past fail to continuous improvement is the first um, theme um, that I'd like to stress. The second is supplementing audits with collaborative assessment um, uh, of root cause analyses, of, of root cause problems. Um, here, the company and its suppliers engage jointly in assessments of factory performance. Why, is, why does this continue to go wrong? What, what is it about the way we do business that fails to achieve the kind of progress that we expect? And that can't be a unilateral thing. It has to be, a, it has to be at least a bilateral thing. The, prod, the, 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 the reasoning cannot be monological. It has to be dialogical. Otherwise, not sufficient learning uh, takes place. And inevitably, that ensures greater buy-in on the part of the suppliers themselves. The third theme um, is the role of supplier-level grievance mechanisms, um, which are becoming increasingly um, common. But uh, too often, um, they are tokenistic. And if they are tokenistic, they raise expectations and then fail to deliver. Uh, which fuels the impression that they're being used to undermine real dialogue with workers, unions, uh, and others, rather than support it. Effective supplier-level grievance mechanisms can serve as an early warning system, supplementing audits. Right? You learn so much more from grievance mechanisms than you do from audits because they're ongoing. It isn't once every three months or whatever the case may be. It's an ongoing process. <clears throat> um, and they, they therefore provide additional data points. Uh, they raise um, issues early before they escalate um, into major um, confrontations. And they, of course, can also help identify and address underlying root causes. They're particularly important in areas where um, unions are, are weak um, or not mature uh, yet or, frankly, corrupt. Uh, providing redress for harm that a company has caused or in which it's otherwise involved is encompassed under the guiding principles. It's one of the important elements of the UN guiding principles. The fourth, which you know well about, um, given your own recent um, um, emphasis, um, is the integration of capacity building approaches um, for suppliers. Suppliers have to be in a position to address the identified challenges. Um, otherwise, it's an academic exercise. Now, awareness raising through pamphlets or webinars or posters is an important first step, but it's not enough. Um, what is enough? Well, it, it, it needs to include other elements, such as providing technical expertise uh, to uh, identifying operational efficiencies that can reduce pressures on working hours and forced overtime. Training on advanced practices that can reduce adverse social and environmental impacts. And they can also be financial. One company that participated in our study has an innovation fund. They literally a fund for innovative practices that suppliers come up with that they get rewarded for. Um, the fifth theme um, is forming NGO partnerships. Uh, a key feature of the social compliance programs of many leading companies is the extensive use they make of NGO partnerships. Um, these play a number of roles from helping to um, establish credible certification or compliance standards to providing capacity building support um, in the form of training and guidance materials to joint problem solving on particularly complex issues. Um, you know, there are many different kinds of NGOs. Some are pure advocacy groups. Others are out there because they really do want to improve workplaces uh, and are prepared to roll up their sleeves and participate um, in the process. The sixth theme providing commercial incentives. Um, to paraphrase one company leader involved in the shift study, 
He said, ignoring economic incentives is to live in a land of illusion. Now, if that's true for global brands and retailers, why would it be any less true for their suppliers? So in return for sustained improvements in social performance, uh, such incentives can include price premiums, volume increases, uh, extended contract duration, preferential contracting, and helping successful suppliers to move up the value chain. It's not rocket science. It's just not done enough uh, by many uh, companies. Um, the seventh theme is to develop metrics that help suppliers identify the business case for their own so better social performance. So external drivers like incentives um, can certainly uh, provide an effective driver, but perhaps promoting a better understanding of internal in incentives um, may be an even more sustainable um, approach. And here, frankly, we have only anecdotal evidence. We have no serious metrics um, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know, we all have our favorite story about how uh, good relationships um, mean less turnover, it means fewer accidents, it means all sorts of other things, but there are no good metrics uh, measuring these things, and you and your suppliers are in a perfect position to help develop um, such metrics. The eighth point, and here we get into sensitive territory, um, aligning internal purchasing practices with your own social commitments. Even where a supplier gets the business case, there's still the proverbial elephant in the room. And that is to what extent the purchasing practices of buyers contribute to the very conditions their compliance programs are intended to address. Now you know better than I do what those practices are. Ever shorter lead times, producing greater varieties of products in smaller batches, last minute order changes, relentless cost pressures. Now, in my judgment, responsible purchasing is as important as responsible manufacturing. Let me say that again, responsible purchasing is as important as responsible manufacturing. And here, leading companies have attempted to create greater functional alignment between purchasing and compliance programs within their own firms, including reviewing orders before they are placed to see whether they're actually doable without violating labor standards, right? Again, it's not rocket science, it just isn't done. In some cases, um, upstream managers are provided with downstream impact reports. Here are the consequences of the decisions you made. Here are the consequences of the orders you placed. And in a few cases, those, rep those results um, um, make, even make it into um, the uh, performance reviews of upstream managers. And that's where you begin to get real change real quickly. And my ninth and final point is um, company and industry-wide collaboration to tackle systemic issues. No company alone can tackle systemic issues. Uh, my, the, the, um, uh, the larger systemic issues um, require um, collaborative approaches. Although it's too late for the many workers who lost their lives in Bangladesh, fire factories, uh, fi uh, 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 factory fires and, and building collapses, the responses since Rana Plaza illustrate the potential of collaborative approaches to such systemic issues and their desirability as preventative measures. But it really shouldn't take catastrophes on that scale to get brands, retailers, and trading companies to pool their leverage in order to generate change. Now, some of the innovations that I've outlined here may be more familiar to you than others. 
Companies are testing them in an increasing variety of ways and learning as they do so. But scalable change can happen only if companies also share their experiences. And here's where transparency kicks in. I, I, I know all of the arguments against transparency. I've worked with enough lawyers to know all of the arguments against transparency. The fact of the matter is, um, in my, in my e e experience, um, that uh, a company that genuinely um, uh, engages in efforts for change get credit for doing so. They don't get punished for doing so. Now, um, one, one, one further point. Um, the whole issue of, of reporting. Um, this isn't a theme yet because it's still a work in progress. So next, next year, maybe I will be Moses and have 10 themes. Uh, this will have been the 10th. Uh, but um, SHIFT, the organization I mentioned earlier, together with uh, Mezars, the uh, accounting and consulting firm, have been developing um, a framework for, uh, frameworks for reporting and assurance for the last 18 months. Uh, and Unilever has just agreed to road test, to, to pilot um, 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 the, uh, the reporting framework in Indonesia. It's intended to be fully aligned with the UN guiding principles. It's currently open for public consultation and I invite you to participate and it's posted on the Business and Human Rights Resource Center uh, website. Uh, it's open for comments. So let, let, let me draw these remarks to a close. Um, I readily acknowledge, as I said at the outset, that the challenges that you face are not easy ones. If they were, they, they would have been dealt with long ago. They're difficult, and I think we all appreciate how difficult um, they are. Uh, moreover, you um, are, are, are just one part of a larger ecosystem, right? Um, which ultimately involves the very workings of an increasingly integrated global economy, um, coupled with a highly fragmented and frequently dysfunctional system of global governance and even national governance. And finally, your initiative includes companies that are not large by global standards, you know, the, the Mittelstand as it's known um, uh, in German, whose individual leverage therefore is limited, um, as is their human and financial capacity. And I think we need to acknowledge those facts. But at the same time, you have the advantage of being in a collective effort of 1,400 participating companies representing somewhere around 600 billion euro in annual turnover. Those numbers speak. Those numbers speak if they're leveraged. And to leverage them requires collaborative approaches to the challenges that none of you can deal with um, on your own. So I urge all of you to redouble your efforts to explore emerging practices such as those that I've outlined and to adopt those that show the best results. Um, the cries for social justice um, in our increasingly turbulent world are getting louder. Um, and one reason for that is that the dislocating consequences of globalization have exceeded the capacity of too many societies to adapt rapidly enough. And they've exceeded the ability of too many individuals to enjoy the, to, to enjoy the benefits of globalization. And if there is to be sustainability of business or the environment or markets, um, we've got to deal with those issues. And all of us have a role um, in dealing uh, with them. The need is great, the time is short, and the mission um, is clear. All of us have to do better, um, much better, than we have in the past. So thank you again for the honor of inviting me um, and giving me the opportunity to proselytize here this morning. 
And of course, I'll be uh, happy to uh, respond to any criticisms or comments and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you.